you know the pressure is on to deliver better and more predictable results. This is nothing new to anyone, and it goes back in time. At the same time, the, the recent pace of technology continues to accelerate. I mean, Moore's law keeps going out there, although I'd say Negroponte's law that got into the uh, the value of the network increases with each additional node exponentially, even if it's a linear uh, addition, keeps on hitting us. So today, it, from the revenue side, if you're even if your results today are good, you know that businesses that are still clinging to, shall we say, some dated internal processes and tools are going to have competition issues. My name is Eric Charles. I've been with exactly long enough to be part of the transition from when we started from incentive compensation management then into sales performance management. And now we've gone into this upstream and downstream challenges of the full revenue cycle and the data and systems needed to optimize. And, and I wanted to dig deeper into the question of revenue intelligence, the use of integrated different software platforms and how this can all tie together with the human behavioral side of the sales team, or really I should correct my language already of the revenue team. So I figured I would invite two of the top people in the industry who are at the forefront of the changing business world to help work through the challenges and raise some new and maybe raise some new ones that I hadn't thought about. So my pure guests today are Steve Silver, who's the VP Research Director at Forrester, and Pascal Yamin, who's the General Manager of Revenue Cloud at Salesforce. I figured that's got to cover the gamut of all of it. Um, and because I keep on looking back at everything and like my career, I've gone from a Rolodex to being a beta user of Salesforce when I was able to get five seats free for my startup uh, to a world where it, really everyone and everything, and I bring the, the human side of that into that very specifically, can be integrated. But let's face it, it's been a slow rollout on the marketplace to get everything talking to each other. So Steve, I'll go ahead and start with you. Um, you know, we, we worked together when exactly commissioned to study from Forrester Consulting. And I know that you always have another bit of interesting content coming out. So what areas are you looking at right now in this revenue cloud, which is Pascal's word, or really this intelligent revenue, revenue intelligence space? Yeah, thanks, Eric. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here with uh, both of you today. So uh, at a high level, we're really looking at the future of selling. And, and the influence that changing buyer and customer expectations is having, uh, the impact of new technology. And then of course, this, this drive for scalable, repeatable revenue ecosystems, right? And so we're looking at, well, how is all this coming together? What does that mean for uh, sales or revenue organizations? What does that mean for uh, sales professionals? And, and how uh, will that evolve over time? Underneath that, there's, there's a subset that I think is uh, particularly interesting, which is uh, the drive for something or the need for something we call an insight-driven sales system. And, and we're thinking there in terms of insights, which are an actionable guidance delivered to either the sales rep, sales manager, sales leader, revenue leader, uh, at the point of need in a way that's very consumable and helps them make better business decisions. And of course, a key component of that is, is the data and the technology that's used to collect and, and, and deliver those insights. And so, you know, at a broad level, this is having impact across the entire revenue ecosystem. I think to your point, Eric, to everything from planning to compensation, to performance management, to technology, to sales process and, and people. And so it's a really fascinating time in this particular industry. So, so in Pascal, I, I remember when Salesforce announced the revenue cloud, I was like, ah, okay, hold it. We've got the sales cloud, we've got the marketing cloud, we've got the service cloud, now we've got the revenue cloud. And it was right in the same time I was starting to see these titles change, like all of a sudden a head of sales operations was this head of revenue operations and things like that. Now I have, I'll admit, because of my career path, a strong tendency, I just look at sales leadership. And, and I've at least tried to break out of the, I only look at sales leadership and frontline sales reps, but and you, you kind of, I say gently chewed me out or really told me that I need to step back. And if you're going to think about revenue, you got to think of a larger part of the organization. Yeah, that's right. And first of all, thanks, thanks for having me, Eric. It's a pleasure to be, uh, uh, to be here with you and, and you as well, Steve. Uh, I've been looking forward to this day for a while, uh, but that's right. And, and you know, first of all, I, I just love the, 
both of you in your in your first comments, Eric, you talked about the human element of this is so important. I hope we'll spend more time on that during this conversation. And Steve, you started with selling and then you started talking about the buyer. And that's really important because it's it's it has been a shift from the seller, which most people have, you know, really kind of oriented themselves on to to the buyer. And I say the buyer because they could buy from a lot of places. They could buy from a direct sales rep, they could buy from a partner or a reseller, or they could buy direct through digital commerce or you know, even through such a device. And so really, really making sure that we think about revenue, no matter where it comes from um, and driving growth, no matter where that growth comes from. And that's a shift in mentality because it changes the focus um, on just revenue growth and the opportunity to bring that together and say, let's not just focus on how we can grow our revenue, but how we can grow our revenue across every channel and do it in a compliant way. And every, so that every transaction that comes through um, it, it you know has the right controls, has the right compliance, and is and is high level quality. Right, and quality of revenue is important, um, and that's 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 a new mentality, um, and it's it accelerated significantly in the last year as it relates to the pandemic. Um, it's already started before that, but it's just accelerated significantly, and, and it's forcing a lot of companies to figure out how to do that. And um, and there is a natural um, conflict that that we see, which is you know, a, a seller wants to sell because that's how they get compensated. And so whenever they are not able to sell because a, a buyer could buy from a different channel, um, that's there's some kind of conflict. And so it's important for, for companies to understand how to solve that. And again, a lot of that ties back to the human, human performance and human behavior that you mentioned, Eric. Mm -hmm. Now, Steve, you had mentioned that you, because uh, this this decentralization, centralization, I mean, it's almost we're doing both simultaneously. It's like, put more power into the field, but we got to see it all over the top. And I, and all right, so what's what's the laziest, latest fun stuff that you've been digging into on this? Well, I think it just, you know, you're both touching on this topic already. I, I think the, a lot of these issues we're discussing, changes in buyers, changes in sellers, um, the need to see every transaction is is a big driver behind the emergence of revenue operations as a function in a lot of organizations and why they're considering it. Um, so we, we, we've done, uh, just updated a study. We did our first one two years ago, we just updated it. And the change in the number of organizations that are either considering or implementing revenue operations is striking. So it went from about 40% of B2B sales organizations that had some form of revenue operations two years ago to about 90% today. And about 40% of those are in a, a centralized function. And there's, there's of course this, you know, tug of war between centralization and decentralization and, and what's the right model and uh, what is revenue operations still is, is depending on who you ask, you get a different definition mm -hmm. for it. I would say uh, alluding back to something Pascal mentioned this, this issue of uh, insights or, or reporting or measurement and the single source of truth, that was far and away the biggest driver for uh, investing in a revenue operations organization. The need to have a single view of the business, not marketing's view, sales view, customer success view or product view, but one single view that tells senior leadership exactly what's happening in the organization uh, leading to more effective decision-making. No, no, I, I'm I I love random numbers that seem to be the same that have no relationship to each other. Which which my wife is a research psychologist and drives her insane. She's like, just because they're the same doesn't mean there's a correlation. So she's always <laughs> fixing my stats. But because you said ninety percent, you know that that ninety percent number in, in your comment about you know some form of rev ops function. But if I back up to the study that exactly commissioned from Forrester Consulting, there was one of the data points in there that said 90% of companies lack real-time insights into the inefficiencies. And right. the fact that those two numbers are the exact same, I have to, I have to call out. So, I mean, if, if there's these inefficiencies, you know, if people don't know what's going on, what should they be doing? What insights could they be getting out of this? I mean, what's it take to get there? You can't just create a department and say your your revenue operations go. Well, I, it, I'll I'll take that first. You, I think you touched on probably the key issue. A lot of people think, oh, we'll just create a revenue operations function, and that's going to solve all these issues that we have. And we really caution clients against that to to take a step back and think about 
Uh, is, why are you putting a revenue operations function in place or why are you thinking about it? What problem are you trying to solve? It, is the problem, does it require resolution, right? And then is this, uh, this action of putting RevOps in place sufficient to solve that problem? I, I would say that, um, again, back to this idea of uh, uh, data, insights, measurement, uh, there's three key issues that we see. First is uh, they need trustworthy data and they need a lot of it, especially if they're trying to feed some sort of AI engine, right? You, you can't make a decision based on what one sales rep did or one, what, what one customer tells you. So you've got to get to trustworthy data. Uh, second, you need the ability to actually collect and then analyze all that data. So put it into um, uh, some form of database that can, that can be repeatedly analyzed. And then third is that ability to take those insights and deliver them to the key stakeholders at a, a relevant point in time when they can make better business decisions about that. Right? And uh, Pascal, I know this is something uh, you spent a lot of time thinking about, so I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this idea of better, trustworthy data. Yeah, I think it's great. First of all, Eric, I think your wife is um, is is certainly spot on. Um, in, in, and uh, I've learned I've learned I need to listen to my wife more. And I think you should probably listen to yours as well. You know, it's first of all, I think that going back to revenue operations, I, I, what I see is that a lot of companies are starting to use the name, the title, but they all mean it in a very different way. So I think you know, I, I'd love to 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 talk a little about what what is a part of revenue operations as part of this. But before, before we go to that, and, and love to get Steve, your perspective on that as well. But before we get into that, the data, I think Steve, you mentioned it earlier about the like, marketing and the, the different groups, and there's the silos of people, the silos of organizations, there's also silos of data. Um, and, and I've learned very early that you can learn to use the same data to tell a very different story. Um, and I think one of the things that I see as value in, rever in, in a true centralized revenue operations function is that you can you know, have trustworthy data, as Steve mentioned, you have, you know, broad data, you can see the whole flow of revenue from, you know, beginning to the to the end uh, of the life cycle of a customer. Um, but it becomes data that provides true insight on the whole customer lifetime value and, and the whole business. And you can, it helps break away those silos so that you can start to see how the data actually can translate to actual, not just revenue, but quality of revenue and actual um, uh, uh, business benefit. I think that that becomes a difference. Otherwise, what, what I see often is, you know, the marketing department has data that says this and the sales department has data that says that. And they're all looking at the same data, but from different lens to try to prove their perspective. Um, and, and revenue operations really becomes a, a, a way to look at the data in a truly kind of global way and a comprehensive way and drive um, insights uh, that, can, that can break down some of those silos. I mean, Steve, does that mean uh, RevOps has got to like have a login to the ERP system along with uh, their Salesforce login and, and all their other logins? Maybe maybe not a login per se, but, uh, but certainly the ability to pull data from the ERP right. system, right? Yeah. I, I do think that there's a reason that revenue operations is viewed at a, at a quote, higher level than marketing ops, sales ops, customer uh, success operations, because they are responsible for looking across the entire revenue stream from acquisition of new accounts to retention, cross-sell, upsell uh, uh, motions, and, and really thinking about the revenue ecosystem and, and not those silos that uh, Pascal was just describing. Well, which then takes me to the human side of this and the silos and where everybody is. And, you know, I've, I've spent my entire career in trying to convince people to do things. I mean, one of the things I've always said is it's amazing what I can get someone to do for a Starbucks card. And if I were at a live event, I've, I've been able to get people to come up on stage and take a selfie with me for a $20 Starbucks card. It's awesome. You know, that's how I always prove incentives work and, and behavior can be modified. But one of the things we looked into, you know, is is how many companies are incapable of pivoting to adjust the commission plan. And I've even argued that the word pivot is starting to bother me because pivot implies big changes mm -hmm. to me, like, you know, the, the, the classic Friends episode, whereas really they should be making co constant course adjustments as they're going along. It's like, huh, we're not over here. What can we do to change the team's behavior a little bit? You know, this could be even adjusting the quotas or territories. 
you know, but like we 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 had a different study where seventy five percent of companies changed their revenue goals during the pandemic, and I'm just wondering, and how many of you lowered or raised or raised the quota? I mean, if you said if you changed your revenue outlook to go up fifty percent because you're one of the companies that benefited, maybe you sell you know uh, uh, home video and and audio equipment. Did you change the comp plan for your people, or did you, or did you let them make a bunch of money knowing that it's just a super year? And vice versa, if you dropped your revenue outlook, if you, you did an earnings call and said, uh, we're going to see a drop, did you do the same? I mean, I saw stuff in our data, but but what's going on out there? I mean, because if we can get all this data, we 90% have rev ops. How is that trickling down into actually goaling and measuring people that you've seen or thoughts? You want me to react to that first, Eric? <laughs> sure. Why don't you take it and then we'll let Pascal. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think there's two reasons why uh, organizations are so slow to, to react to market conditions, especially where things where sales compensation is concerned. Um, first, frankly, many of their systems are just outdated where compensation management, sales performance, sales planning is concerned. Uh, you, you would, well, you too probably wouldn't be shocked, but I continue to be shocked by how many large organizations are managing compensation on Word documents and spreadsheets. You just cannot move quickly when that's the way you're, you're managing a complex uh, process like that. And, and that leads to the second point, which I think is, um, let's call it fear, right? Fear of the unknown. If, if you're managing compensation on a spreadsheet, for example, it's really hard to model out what if, what if we change this? What if we change that? What's the result likely to be? And so, you know, paralysis through analysis or fear of making change and the unknown impacts of that. And, and those two things, of course, work together. The more we automate, the more uh, data we can collect about compensation and sales performance, the more planning we can do and the faster we can react to the marketplace. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, the word automation is so important. Steve, you said it a few times there, automation, automation, automation. The reality is, is, you know, it's hard to make these changes. Historically, it's been hard to make these changes for a lot of reasons, systems reasons, data reasons, but the emotional side of it, and there's, there's you know, changing a comp plan is something that is not um, easy to do without having to handle the human emotional side of it too. You know, if you're changing the way salespeople are compensated or what they're compensated on or how they're compensated, you know, you have to think about that. Um, and, you know, in, in, in the more confidence you have the data, the more um, agility you have in the business to be able to make those changes in, in a fast way and kind of build that into your culture, um, the, the easier it is to, to uh, mitigate those emotional elements. But that's a big shift. I mean, it's, it's going to be hard for companies to go from, you know, sales planning being once a year activity and sales quotas being once a year activity and then once it's set, you know, it's like an act of God to change, right? That's kind of the way it is. And again, even if you can technically change it, doesn't mean it's going to happen. It's just for all those reasons, hard to change. Um, and that that model isn't going to is is going to be uh, a limitation for a lot of companies that were, you know, they're they can't they can't be agile, they can't adjust, they can't adjust to the market conditions. And uh, again, last the last twelve months have shown us the importance of the ability. To have that agility and to adjust, and you know, companies have um, who were able to adjust and, and agile, and like he, like he mentioned, maybe reduce their quotas or, or increase it or change what the compensation was based on. It may not be changing quotas; it might might be more around keeping higher margins or better quality revenue. Companies who were able to make those changes fast um, were able to survive more effectively, and others obviously weren't. And so, I think it's becoming more important. I think the last year has proved. To um, companies around the world, they have to figure out how to get that muscle um, in the systems, in the data, and in the processes, and most importantly, in the people. Um, so, so it's 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 not easy. I think Steve had corrected me before when I said it's easy. You know, I think I think it's easier now than ever before uh, because we have better systems, we have better data, we have better tools, we have more automation, we have more ability to use AI to make, take the data and make sense out of it. Um, but it still isn't easy because the, the human side of it is always part of it, um, but it is easier. And I think it's more and more critical now than it's ever been before. Well, it, it's funny because I've I made the ERP quip, you know, do, does RevOps need to be able to get into the financial system? And what I should have added was how about HRIS? Because like one of the things we see a lot of is, is we see in our system, you know, the people moving from job to job or people leaving the system. I always say, I don't know why somebody left your sales team, 
Yeah. But I know they're they're not there anymore. And those different sinks that start coming into play are such a part of the game. I mean, I've even did some analysis uh, with a professor at uh, uh, Carlson School of Management where we looked at the 80-20 rule where, you know, 80% of revenue is oftentimes brought in by as little as 20% of the sales reps, which means having slightly higher turnover among your top performers is a revenue operations problem. But it's an HR problem, and it's a it's a finance problem, and it kind of ripples through. And that's that'll be the interesting thing to me is that centralized dashboard needs to include like turnover by the teams, turnover by top performers, turnover by potential performers. Like how long does it take to to build? You know, your you know, people talk about ramp time for new hires, but I've I've been arguing how about ramp time for an uh, an account development rep who books meetings to becoming a junior eight account executive to a senior account executive to sales management path. And I think it's gonna take a longer look on that, on that human side of that entire training and and, and, and uh, enabling side. That's where I think sales enablement is probably gonna, you know, where sales enablement sit in this whole organization as well to make sure they're covered. And then if it's not just sales, how about, do we need a customer success enablement team, a customer support enablement team that does all that training so that everybody's saying, you know, as the old line goes, singing from the same hymnal. I don't know, things are gonna keep changing. Final thoughts from you two gentlemen. Uh, Actually, Pascal, I'll go to you first. Well, first of all, again, thank you you both for for having me and be part of this. Um, To me, we've touched on a lot of topics. I wanna kind of come back to um, revenue operations. I think it's so important as we have these conversations, as we collaborate across, Forester and Zach being Salesforce, that we start to develop more consistent definitions of what it means, uh, what's in revenue operations, what's not. Because you know, people could use different terms, it doesn't really matter. But I think the, the power of, uh, of what's available, the power of what we can do as a as a as a company as companies, as you know, in terms of um, uh, with our businesses, with our with our customers, with our stakeholders. Is, is significant. And I think the it is so important for us to help people understand how revenue operations can play a role here, how it can actually make a difference. And, and again, it goes way well more than just dollars and cents. It goes into actually the stakeholders that we can impact, you know, the people's lives that we can impact on all sides. And to me, this plays a huge role. Um, you know, the data that we talked about is critical. The processes we talked about are critical. The controls, the automation. Um, and so I, I think we are in a great place in, in society, will we, where we were finally getting the attention and the 90% number is amazing to me. I never would have thought it would be that high, by the way, it's just like already that high. But I think what we need to do together is, is get people to think about um, defining it in, in, in a consistent way and really understanding the powerful power of it and using it for good, not only for their own individual businesses, but for actually the stakeholders around. And, you know, that's one of the priorities for us is, is, is really focusing on quality of revenue and also quality of how it impacts the communities around you. Um, and and it's and it's not it's an odd thing, but it's an important thing because the agility we talked about and everything we talked about so far um, is more than just the ability of your business. It's the ability of how your business reacts to society and changes in society and the community around you. And um, you know, we could probably spend an hour just on that topic alone. I just wanted to, I just wanted to bring it as part of my closing thoughts to make sure we don't forget it. I, I would echo that actually, Pascal. I think it's. Um... Uh, you know, to quote a great book, it's the best of times, it's the worst of times where uh, the selling profession is concerned. Uh, th- there's no doubt in our mind anyway that that sales as a profession is changing. A lot of these changes have been uh, accelerated or exacerbated by the pandemic, but they were already in motion, uh, many of them. We've got um, new technologies emerging all the time that get us give us greater insights into both seller behavior, buyer behavior, customer behavior, um, that's the good news. We've got more data than ever available uh, to us to manage that. In theory, we can react faster to that. And, and all of that is kind of driving the emergence of revenue operations. On the, the, the um, perhaps challenging side or the worst of, uh, of time side, you know, it can be a little hard to figure out, well, what's the right technology stack? Um, mm-hmm. How do I not just collect all this data, but how do I make it actionable? How do I uh, deliver those insights into the organization? And then I think to your point, Pascal, what does that mean for our people and our culture, right? Are we replacing sales reps? Are we, you know, what's changing and how do we adapt 
um, the, the organization to continually be agile. So, uh, you know, I do think it's, um, it's a really exciting time to be in the sales profession. I think you're going to continue to see uh, fundamental changes, but for the most part, I think it's all very positive and, and uh, there's a lot of upside here. Well, gentlemen, um, next time we do this, I'd like to just set up a camera at the local pub, um, put a pint in front of each one of us and continue it going. We just let somebody else edit out all the all the mistakes. But uh, it, I, I can't wait till we can do that. But I want to thank you both for joining me today, um, getting to the subject of, of revenue operations, revenue cloud and where are we all going, you know, how you know, basically how many companies should be looking at this, what level of an overhaul, or really just using the tools they might already have to rethink, to go from like, as you mentioned, Pascal, the annual planning to continuous planning, yeah. continuous adjustment, continuous, you know, if, I always say, it's like, if you make minor adjustments, you won't have to make the big pivot, you just, but you have to have a culture that allows for that as well. And, and as I'll always say, and you can make all the cha changes you want at the board level, but unless you communicate to the people out in the field on the front lines what they're supposed to do, you're not going to get there. And you know me, I always say the best way to communicate is put that Starbucks card, put that commission plan, put that bonus plan in front of them. <laughs>